We are lucky to have Dr. Marty Van Hals, Director General and Chief Science Officer at the Royal uh, Netherlands Meteorological Institute, also known as KNMI. Um, you know, before uh, joining KNMI, uh, Martin, you know, in his career has worn several hats, um, you know, both as a scientist, is uh, you know, full professor of uh, climate and disaster resilience at the University of Twente, uh, as a sort of like Scientist supporting policymaking, or policymaker, is uh, a lead author of the um, IPCC. And uh, uh, also, many of you know Martin because he has led the, uh, the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center for over a decade, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, we actually invited Martin because today, you know, we have discussed this morning in the plenary, we're looking at the future, and we have discussed that. You know, we are looking five, ten years uh, ahead. But with Martin, we really wanted to take this opportunity to look, you know, further beyond, like for, you know, more forward uh, in the future. So um, we asked Martin to actually help us sort of like setting the scene. Uh, and then there will be an opportunity to have an exchange with him. So we asked him to really talk about, you know, climate models, you know, climate change uh, projections and potentially impacts uh, for, you know, humanitarian action. So over to you, Martin, for some initial remarks. Thank you, and really nice to be here. Um, I, I just came back um, this morning by train from Geneva, where I spent the past two days at the uh, WMO, the World Meteorological Organization uh, Executive Council, uh, which was spending most of its time discussing early warnings for all. Uh, probably familiar to many of you. And um, there is now a roadmap. Uh, I think we've spent way too much time talking quite inwardly, um, actually in, in, in all of the, the four organizations that, that are joining up, um, not reaching out enough. And I think that, real, that realization was very palpable in the room. Uh, there's a sense that um, the whole agenda of using information better for real world results has come a long way. It's, it's moved up the political agenda. It's moved up in terms of our tooling and our capacity to analyze data, but it's not yet making enough of a difference in the world. And it's really exciting to have an opportunity to, to be with you and, and talk to you, because I know this is a community that's actually really making those linkages. Um, and as I said, there's much more appetite than there was before, but we still have a lot of work to do to take it to the scale that, uh, that it needs. Um, and it really needs that scale, because that is probably the summary of, of the climate message that, that I would bring as well. Um, and I, I just wanted to start with this perspective, looking a little bit back. Apologies for, I will come to the longer term future as well. But, but it also sort of illustrates where we are today, or actually where we've been now for a while, which, which is also the daily reality many humanitarian organizations are, of course, very much confronted with. But that actually we, we need to realize for many people in the world is still quite a novel realization, namely that climate change is really already happening around us. And this was the, the picture, uh, I hope you can see it in the back of the room, um, but it's a sort of Parisian street with a flood coming in, right? And, and this was the, the post that French Red Cross produced in 2015, just ahead of that big climate summit where in the end the Paris Agreement was produced. To basically tell a narrative of why the Red Cross was even there, right? People were wondering at that time, why are humanitarian organizations even engaged on climate? Uh, and of course, the story is that extremes are also changing. And there is, so in, in French, it says something like, we'll always be there to help you, the lifeboat, but let's please prevent that from being necessary. Of course, with the dual message, on the one hand, reducing emissions, and on the other hand, in this case, in Paris, doing pl proper flood risk management to prevent those impacts from actually hurting people and, and, and uh, losing lives. Um, so this was a narrative that we needed to construct with a graphic artist to bring in people's minds what we were concerned about as humanitarians, in this case also in the city of Paris, whereas mostly what humanitarians were concerned about, of course, is global. So we also tried to bring it closer to the hearts and minds of people, actually, you know, the diplomats in, in, in Paris and also from the richer countries. But it was thought of as that sort of artist impression of something that might happen if we would not do the right thing. And it would probably happen somewhere in the end of the century. It would happen to you and it would happen in your own city, but it, it would be far away. It's the sort of thing that we were really going to prevent together. And we came out of the Paris summit really proud also of what had been achieved policy-wise, right? And it has been a major milestone. It has made a big difference in the world. But if you can show the next slide, 
Well, can I do that here? Yeah, perfect. Um, this is what, oh, thanks. This is what Paris looked like just half a year later. So not at the end of the century after all our policies had failed, but we had life rafts in the streets of Paris. And that is the daily reality um, around the world, but, but also indeed in some of the countries that we considered least vulnerable. I mean, look at southern Germany just last week, right? Uh, and it's a combination of all of these factors. First of all, it is the hazards really changing, right? That happened again. I mean, the 2021 floods in Germany were already a reminder of that. It's the same with the, the, the floods of last week. So the hazards are changing. Um, in southern Germany also, it wasn't like in many of the repeat hazards that we're facing in the humanitarian world. It wasn't the first time this happened. And they had taken some measures to deal with the, the flooding, uh, primarily around the bigger cities where the biggest political uh, issues had, had, had played up after the, the previous floods. So it's primarily the smaller settlements that were, that were affected. And then they basically just didn't have their crisis management in order. And they're still not able to translate what was a really, I mean, from the perspective, the, the classical meteorologist perspective. So how did the World Meteorological Organization might have looked at this 20 years ago? This would have been a great event. You know, we had forecasted that excess rainfall and uh, even the hydrological models were quite accurate. But of course, by now, we really feel like we're failing because the information has not been put to use. And actually, people lost their lives and, and of course, massive damages that could have been prevented. So this is the reality that we're in now every day and, and all around the world, of course, with the biggest concerns being about the most vulnerable. I can give you one more example. The, the first day I, I started uh, this job in the Netherlands, coming from the humanitarian world, where my frustration day to day was, was always the frustration many of you will be feeling, right? Often lack of data and always lack of money. So you're, you're setting priorities based on very limited information in very difficult circumstances. Um, and I felt... You know, I, I made my contribution. I think it was also good a good time for a, a, a team of people to take that further without me sort of being the, 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 the person equated with, with uh, some of the work we had been doing in the Red Cross. So I felt it was, in general, time for new leadership. But I also really liked the challenge, in a way, of contributing from a developed country perspective in the Netherlands, uh, where the, the data are as good as you can get them in the world, and money is, in principle, not a problem. I mean, of course, money is always a problem, but in principle, it's not, it's not the real constraint. And I can tell you, after a year, we're getting so many things wrong. You know, so many lessons that I took from the humanitarian world to the Netherlands, or that I could tell you as stories about the Netherlands that, that, that illustrate what we're facing everywhere. And that is also a powerful element of this narrative of what you've been struggling with, where to some extent, what you've already been doing, for instance, on, on impact-based forecasting and setting thresholds for action, that is actually super relevant to Southern Germany. Uh, but it's relevant in countries that didn't consider themselves vulnerably, part, con didn't consider themselves vul very vulnerable, partly because those hazards are changing and also partly because we need a new lens on, on our exposure, on heat, for instance, also with a, an, an aging population while the hazards are also changing rapidly. And on my first day, I immediately got, a, got an opportunity to comment on this because th that first day was the day we were commemorating the 1953 floods that some of you may be familiar with. Um, if I ask people about the top three of most deadly disasters in the Netherlands, everyone comes up with that 1953 flood first. The other two most deadly ones, by the way, happened in the last 20 years, and they were, they were both um, heat disasters, which still no one in the Netherlands realizes is such a big killer. So we've got work to do there as well. But the floods from 1953 are a landmark in the Netherlands, and it led to a massive shift in government policy, a, a, a great willingness to, inspend, to spend billions and billions and billions on coastal protection at a one in 10,000 year standard of acceptable uh, major uh, dike breaches of the, 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 the primary uh, coastal protection. So that, that is in place now and, and is now much more expensive to maintain in a changing climate. But the question I got was, first of all, did we see this coming in 1953? And secondly, could something like this happen again to the Netherlands? Are there any scenarios also from your climate models that, that, that show this could happen? Um, and the first answer is, yes, we did see it coming and people did not heed the warning. These are the hand-drawn maps from the day before that big event. We actually even called on the evening before this massive disaster that, that where we lost 2,000 lives before it happened. We called the national radio station. There was one radio station at the time, and it would shut, up, shut off at um, 11 in the evening uh, because there were not too many listeners at night, and it was a, a costly enterprise at the time still. 
Um, and we told them there's a really heavy front system coming and we expect really big problems in the country. There were certainly no two-way communications, no mobile phone, no mobile phones, whatever. But you know, a radio was a very important way of reaching people and, and getting out warning or, or even crisis information at that time when it was needed. So we pleaded, please keep the radio station going and, and let's be in touch between the Built and Ilversum, the Met Office and, and, and the radio broadcasting company. Uh, but they said, no, 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 it's not going to be so bad. And you know, this is... So they played the national anthem like they did every night at 11 p.m., shut off the radio station. And then at 2 a.m., the fir first dike broke and there was no way of still communicating with, with the affected population. So that's a lesson learned in terms of our ineffectiveness, even despite not having the greatest supercomputers, not having the new AI tools, we did see what was coming to the, the biggest extent, but we failed to communicate in time in the right ways. And then could it happen again? Well, in a way, we got some really out of the spectrum events already. And this was Storm Ophelia in 2017. So that's already a few years ago now. But this is basically one of those Caribbean hurricanes that crossed all the way across the Atlantic and actually did cause massive damages, but also a couple of casualties in fortunately very um, uh, sparsely populated areas in, uh, in Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, so... And, and this was something that we really didn't see coming. And, and the question was, is that already climate change? Well, it turned out we did see these storm systems crossing the Atlantic, in this case, in a future weather run for 2098. Um, so it's there in our climate knowledge about something that could happen in a potential future, but it's already there right now. And the second thing was, could it have um, affected the Netherlands and could it have entered particularly that channel between the Netherlands and, and England and, and really affected our country? And the answer is yes, that could have happened as well. We were lucky in a way that it ended up where it ended up. So that is the world in which we are confronting the same challenges that humanitarians are, are, are confronting. And then I see our med service primarily servicing basically prevention activities, which is where we want the, the, the humanitarian world primarily also to go, right? The whole broader disaster risk reduction agenda rather than just response. But in the Netherlands, I now sort of face the, res the reverse problem. You know, people really eat up our climate scenarios, our sea level rise scenarios, like, like sweet cakes when it's about raising dikes to keep to the one in 10,000 level of protection. But confronting the fact that we may see st things like this not coming and that we may have miscalculated what one in 10,000 still means at this point and something could fail at some point, And then we do need crisis management and we need to think about response capacity and put the ability to react into our models about what sort of risks we actually fail, uh, we actually face. Uh, that is a different ballgame that also a country like the Netherlands is not protected in. And I think that is where we need that blending of very different types of disciplines that, that you do see happening in the humanitarian data community, where increasingly it's not just understanding the hazards, it's not just understanding hazards plus exposure and vulnerability, it's also understanding the responses that we're taking, the ability of those responses to, um, to mitigate certain actions. And then in some cases also the limits to adaptation. So that is also a new reality that we're facing in the Netherlands where we're seeing in our low likelihood, high impact scenarios that we, so we publish a, a set of IPCC based scenarios for the Netherlands. Um, and we, we did ours last, uh, last fall based on the AR6 cycle. And there's a, a set of general scenarios which pose heavy risks, heavy costs to the Netherlands, like, you know, a meter of sea level rise is, is sort of a median range expectation with the types of outcomes that we now expect. And that is a heavy cost investment if you want to keep to a one in 10,000 year uh, protection, for instance. And that is inundation problems, right? But imagine um, uh, saline intrusion, the cost of agriculture, the challenges of get, keeping riverine water out. So it, it creates a, a, a massive list of additional challenges. Um, that's the median type of scenario. The worst case scenario is 18 meters of sea level rise by 2300. And how do you weigh the risk of those low likelihood, high impact scenarios when you're making policy in a country that is partly already several meters below sea level, right? And these are realities that are actually coming quite, quite a lot closer to some of those dense settlements in highly vulnerable conditions right now in developing countries. So I think we're in this all together and that's part of the narrative that I'm also trying to bring together when we present these, these scenarios for the Netherlands. Um, and a big portion of it is dealing with uncertainty. And at some point also 
quantifying where we can, but also having narratives about unquantifiable uncertainties that we still need to weave into our, our responses and our crisis management. And one additional example that I just mentioned, and I'll shut up and let, let you ask questions or let, the, let, let all of you ask questions. Um, this is already a big challenge. And these questions about these, these high-end scenarios and so how we deal with them even in thinking about the risks we face and the mix of responses we need, not just higher dikes, but also better crisis management, especially for vulnerable groups. Um, and then, of course, this is in the easy context of the Netherlands, multiplied it by a factor of 1,000 for the places where, where most of you will be working. The real challenge we're facing in the Netherlands already right now, and I think it's increasingly the reality in the rest of the world as well, is actually illustrated by the Paris story as well. The reason Paris had such, and I can zoom back to, to this one, uh, that this happened was that it, it was a lot of rainfall. We did the calculations, which is also contributing to this loss and damage discussion. Of course, we can do the data crunching on these individual events now. This was 40% more likely already in 2015 due to the changing climate. Um, but 40% more likely is actually not a, a sea change in, in levels of risk, right? So the real reason it was such a big problem in Paris is that it happened in June. Anyone an idea why? No, it's, not the, it's actually not the rainy season. It's almost the reverse. So Paris has big reservoirs upstream from the city that would be empty in March. So if you'd had the same amount of rainfall in March, it would have been fine. The reservoirs would have been empty to start with, and you could shave the peak of the, the hydrological uh, event by filling the reservoir. But you can already imagine what's happening in June. It's actually not the rainy season. It's the hot and dry, ever hotter and drier summer, where the challenge for Paris is keeping enough water flowing through the rivers and having enough water for, uh, for drinking water and all of that. So the reservoirs in early June are filled to the peak to deal with drought risk. And so then when you get the same amount of rainfall, you're suddenly stuck. And that's what we're facing in the Netherlands as well with the combination of hotter and drier summers and at the same time, the increase in extreme rainfall. Sound familiar for parts of Eastern Africa, for instance, in the past couple of years? I mean, we are facing these scenarios everywhere. And the way we're coping with one risk may sometimes not help us dealing with the other risks. And certainly one of the big messages will be, be prepared for these complex situations where the responses themselves are becoming risks, where compound risks are the, 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 the norm rather than the example. And beware of simplified sim single hazard solutions because it's, it's gonna bite us. And then I'm not even talking about what the, the, the challenges that we're now facing. So maybe I'll zoom out as in the final minute to the big IBCC story. We are running out of carbon space to stay below the 1.5 degrees norm of the Paris Agreement really rapidly. 50% chance of staying below 1.5 basically means we've got about six years of our current carbon emissions left. And even if we reduce them a bit, maybe it's seven years, but early 2030s, we'll have used all of that up. So unless we completely stop all emissions at that point, we will, and that's even for a 50% chance, right? That's not security. It's 50% chance of staying below. Otherwise, we'll already go above it, even with that gigantic uh, gigantic challenge. So this, the short answer is we're not meeting that. Um, and that means three options, basically. One is, um, and, and we will need to do everything we can to mitigate faster, right? That's, that's one element of this. But the second element of it is um, dealing with higher risks high risks in Europe and countries like the Netherlands are already paying a price for that. It's helping in the mitigation discussions. It's, it's, it's putting the adaptation discussions higher on the agenda, but we need a crisis management component of that. And we need a right realization that it's going to hurt us in the rest of the world even harder. So that's one element. The second is the, um, the responses on the carbon side. So we, we will not be able to get our emissions down fast enough. And we're going to be seeing risks that are going to be so painful that we want a solution faster. And one of these is negative emissions. So there is going to be a big market coming up in the coming 10 years or so to actually take carbon out of the atmosphere. For instance, by growing biofuels, burning the biofuels to generate electricity, capturing the CO2 and storing it underground. In theory, a nice story, but if you do it at the sort of scale that might be required, that biofuel production in itself becomes a very attractive market that starts to compete with food production and starts to compete with biodiversity protection, which in itself might again generate 
humanitarian challenges. So that is the bigger scale of responses that I think you will need to start putting into your scenarios and into your, your data, for instance, when it comes to food security, in terms of how the world will be changing in the coming 10 years. And then the final most radical solution that I had wished we would never even be discussing is actually to actively cool the atmosphere through solutions like solar radiation modification, mimicking volcanic eruptions, for instance, which will indeed cool the atmosphere. We know that. We've seen it with Mount Pinatubo, for instance. You see a temporary dip in global temperatures. You even see a tempor temporary dip in the, in the sea level rise. So it works to counter global warming. It will work to counter some of the extremes. But at the same time, you're messing with a very complex climate system, and you will see, for instance, unexpected changes in rainfall patterns. So some places that are used to getting rainfall will no longer get it. Others that are not used to rainfall will suddenly get a lot. So that's going to, again, it's an intervention that works from a global macro perspective, but it might aggravate humanitarian solutions in some places. Right now, we have no global governance for this. And the fact that we're even discussing it right now signals that I am concerned that we may be in situations where we are deploying these things, partly because we're, we may be reaching tipping points of much faster changes, the 18-meter sea level rise scenario for the Netherlands, for instance. Once that comes very close, it's going to be very tempting for policymakers to take emergency measures. And once again, there will be humanitarian consequences. All of that to say, your data challenges are about to explode. <laughs> in the meantime, the progress on anticipatory action and the use of the data that we do have on how the on these short term extremes that have already gotten much much worse and where we are now unlocking such a huge amount of data for humanitarian action it's one of the biggest and proudest achievements in climate action in the past 10 years one that we need to multiply by a factor 100 to do justice to the scale of the problems but once again it's something to really celebrate as a community so thanks again for all your efforts on that and looking forward to further discussions and drinks very soon thank you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So maybe I'll start with uh, just one question. I would like to bring back the discussion on uh, sort of like the implications for, you know, uh, the work of most of these people, the, of people in, the, in this room. So you said, you know, the climate crisis is already, you know, climate change is happening now. You've been talking about, you know, increased risk. And it's clear that there's this sense of urgency, right? So last week, the uh, UN Secretary General was talking about climate crunch time you know, a moment of truth. So this is kind of a message that is, uh, um, you know, uh, coming more and more. I remember a key figure from uh, uh, a report that uh, um, the Climate Center published, The Cost of Doing Nothing, that was talking, in a, if I'm not mistaken, about a doubling number of people in need of humanitarian assistance by 2050, if I'm not mistaken. And this morning we heard, you know, from Gemma, for instance, you know, D describing already a system that is overstretched. She was talking about really like understanding what should be the priorities, you know, for humanitarian actors and so on. So how do we reconcile, you know, growing needs, you know, well, significantly growing needs according to the projections and the limited sort of like capacity of, you know, uh, humanitarian uh, actors? So d the honest answer is you can't. Right. I mean, this is this is a humanitarian tragedy unfolding in front of our eyes, you know, and, and, and that doubling in 2050 is a, a very moderate set of assumptions. Right. It could it could be a lot worse. Um, the only way to counter that is what in the IPCC is, 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 is called that pathway of sort of climate resilient development, which also means more equality, um, better, go better governance, uh, all of these things that we know are needed, but, you know, are not easy to just get and at the same time you see a world where um again in in, in these sets of ipc scenarios the the most positive ones are one where the world is working together as one on a set of common goals is sharing resources is sharing technological innovation is uh, helping each other out um frankly if i if i look around I, I don't see that unfolding at the moment i think we're seeing fragmentation we're seeing less sharing of technology we're seeing less sharing of resources so um, I'm concerned, uh, frankly. Um, the, the solution is also not just going to come from a humanitarian side. So I think we need to keep repeating that. And, and uh, the big shift in terms of global dynamics that I do see, also, for instance, in the, in the World Meteorological Organization, is that the Global South is stepping up themselves. And uh, so I don't know if there are any people from UNDRR in the room right now, but, but someone like... Uh, Hi. Yeah. So good to see you. 
So Kamal Kishora, for instance, is, is one of those people that I think are representing uh, uh, a generation of leadership that, that's also closely connected to some of the governments that have made big progress themselves, are looking at, 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 at how they deal with challenges in their own societies in a different way, but also may look at, at global distribution of responsibilities in a different way. And right now in the UNFCCC, that is very colored by the classical common but differentiated responsibilities type language for any of you who are, who've been in that, in that world. But I think we need a reset of also more South-South collaboration on this. And, uh, and in the end, also a bigger ownership of the governance of risk in each of these countries individually. And then I would hope that the humanitarian imperative becomes concentrated more on what will be growing pockets of really, really challenging conditions where your work is still going to be desperately needed. But if we just continue to count on the humanitarian response for everything where it's currently being counted on, we're in for a massive disaster. Yeah. Thanks. And yeah, on this point, and just, you know, another question before opening to the, uh, to the room, um, you mentioned, you know, the achievements on uh, anticipatory action. And I know that, you know, during your time at the Climate Center, that's really when anticipatory action became really like, a, you know, was growing more and more. And now it's, a, you know, a topic that we hear, you know, everywhere. It was one of the key topics that the United Arab Network and Partnership Week uh, in Geneva is what donors are willing to, you know, put money on and so on. So, um, well, in 2023, the, uh, I think the amount that was pre-agreed through anticipatory action frameworks was around 150 million US dollars, you know, across countries, across organizations, including, you know, the federation, including uh, SURF, including WFPs and all the uh, actors working on anticipatory action. We have colleagues from Somalia managing an HRP of 1.6 billion. Yeah. So it's really like orders of magnitude. So my question is really, I, you know, is it really like the right tool for this big wave that is, that is coming towards us in terms of, you know, the scale that we can potentially achieve? So what could be, you know, devoted to anticipatory action versus what is really like needed to keep the humanitarian machine, you know, moving? And we're talking about, you know, the 26 billion uh, dollars globally that uh, uh, we have in the um, uh, uh, you know HRPs, and also about the timing. It's still sort of like you know anticipating, but it's still sort of like responding to an event that is coming without necessarily sort of like you know building long-term resilience. So yeah, if you can just comment about what you think will be the role of anticipatory action in five, ten, twenty years uh, from now. Thanks. Yeah, so I think your question already started anticipating some of the answers, uh, and, 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 and rightly so. Um, it, it's not the, the, the end-all answer to all of our humanitarian problems, of course. Um, I think it typically also actually even works best in places that I was hinting at in terms of proper risk governments, where, where you would actually over time want humanitarian actors, certainly the global humanitarian actors, to be moving out, right? I think it's nice for a National Red Cross Society in Uganda to have anticipatory action systems, but I think they should be working with their own med service and in the end with their own National Disaster Management Office and, and just sorting it out as a bunch of actors in Uganda as a national priority, you know. And they should then also get the funding for that as part of their general development envelopes to the extent that we have the, the global solidarity that comes with a shared SDG agenda, for instance. So I, I would really hope that we can move most of that out of, the, out of that realm and that you would then... Um, be asking the question about the role of anticipatory action in relation to those billions of humanitarian funding, primarily for those hardest places, where I think you'll also actually face, and, and this was a discussion we, we had in Geneva the past two days as well, where you may be facing an almost opposite problem, right? Also as a, as a humanitarian system. In some places, you really want to invest in the government institution's capacity to take over and almost build their capacity as a, a model to transition the, the anticipatory action out. And partly also, because that's another concern I have with the, the the way, I mean, I think once again, I mean, 100,000 100, or 150,000 or a million is, um, is, is tiny compared to the scale of the challenge, but it's huge compared to where we were 10 years ago. And eh? so, I mean, let's also not forget how, how and, and we need a further growth. So I think we, we are on an exciting pathway, but, but I do see one risk of that becoming a, a, a neatly organized tooling within a humanitarian financing system also that actually makes it harder to 
to hand over to broader risk management systems, including long-term disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. And I think we really need to engineer it also by building capacity in government institutions in countries where that, that can happen, and also in a wider network of partners in, in civil society and academia, also in those regions and countries to, to make that happen. And that should take a bit of the load off. But then the other part, um, say the Somalia of this world, you may not be able to rely on the government to, to pick up that role anytime soon. And in fact, you may need a, a, an almost neutral interface between the data provision and the humanitarian actors that need to make very difficult prioritization discussions in, in the, the decisions in the field, for instance. So that might be a very different modality. And maybe we should program the anticipatory action also quite deliberately along a, a number of different tracks as we, um, as, we, as we see what we can connect elsewhere and actually move out of the humanitarian system and which parts we, we really see as belonging also for the longer term in the humanitarian system. And then I think you're primarily actually looking at, at the conflict of at least very fragile places. Yeah. Great, thanks. What we've seen is that also like since we started implementing anticipatory action frameworks at OCHA, this has been also like an entry point for improving, you know, the risk analysis that, you know, are informing the actual, all the programming. So since then we actually have, you know, better, you know, acceptance of risk, understanding of, you know, potential scenarios and so on. So it, this is maybe also like another, you know, side benefit of, yeah. You know, um, but I would wish that that wealth of data also to automatically find its way into the programming by UNDP or the World Bank in, in, in the countries where you would you would want to at least over time see a, a transfer, right? And I don't think we're we're there yet on that that handover. Yeah. Okay, there are still drinks waiting for you, so I don't want to keep it very long, but if there are burning questions from the audience, that's the time actually to ask, you know, one or two questions max to uh, Martin. Jakubu, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just building up on what you have said, I am curious to, to, to hear about uh, what would a most effective humanitarian response, in your point of view, would be in 10 or 20 years? What would you think is the best, I mean, and effective humanitarian response would be? given what you have said with your presentation and then everything that's what uh, thank you yeah exactly uh, <laughs> um i mean truly effective would, would would only happen if you see local you know basically what i started out with saying partly right um in, in the Netherlands or in, in Germany, as we saw the last couple of weeks, we don't have everything in order, even though we, ha we in principle would have the technology, the money, and, and in a way also quite a lot of the governance. So um, a, an effective response, at least in those contexts, should be doing the math to be prepared, right? I think it's unexcusable in a way that we're still losing lives in those sorts of cases, even though you could argue they, they had a reason to be surprised because it was something that, that hadn't happened at that scale very often. Uh, certainly the 2021 floods in Germany were, were quite unprecedented. But we should be able to anticipate more of those, also the unexpected, unprecedented extremes, the unseen extremes. There's an, an, a, a, a climate science branch now looking at these unseen disasters, the sort of things that have not yet happened, but that we could be expecting to then be planning for them. I think in all of the cases where the governance conditions are met, I think we have no excuse to still have humanitarian suffering. I think that it also goes for a whole branch of the... The, the humanitarian landscape of of the moment, where I think, well, frankly, as a world, we're we're, we're accepting too much risk and suffering uh, compared to what would be even good development, right? What makes economic sense? So we need to continue hammering that drum and getting more of those development investments, climate action investments towards those agendas. And then I think that would then leave more of the human, the limited humanitarian resources that we have to be faster, but also actually just be properly funded for the cases where we have, I mean, the, the weather is already chaotic and there will be surprises once in a while. The climate is making it worse and there will be conflicts also in 20 years time, I'm sure. So in those places, we then need to have a very effective system that those resources are, that we have enough of those resources and that we can break, get them to the right places really quick. And, and then the anticipatory action mechanism that we've all, all been building can play and. An, a facilitating role to be faster and to be more efficient with that limited money. Uh, but by 
putting it in that context, it also illustrates it that again, I want to come back to the point that that's not going to be the, 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 the one answer to an effective humanitarian response in 20 years. Does that answer the question to an extent? That's a good topic for the drinks in a moment. <laughs> so I said two questions. There was Max here. They actually had one. Thanks, Leonardo. Um, I had a question for you on um, funding and financing. Um, when it comes to carbon sequestration, we've been able to convince the private sector to become involved in this activity by creating some kind of financial instrument in the form of carbon credits, which, Im although imperfect, does give a great incentive for a lot more activity to come into something that we see as a social good. Is there the potential to cr engage with the private sector through some kind of financial instrument to help fund and invest in anticipatory action or other kinds of humanitarian activities? Um, in theory, yes, because the, this this market. So it's currently mostly the voluntary cr credits, probably that you're um, that you're applying. Uh, that that already exists. Uh, there is a, a, a bit of formal trading. The formal trading in C in negative emissions is gonna. Uh, my prediction is over the coming ten years that will explode. So there's currently. Uh, I mean, you see it in all of the emission scenarios, the risks are already becoming visible. We need negative emissions to keep risks manageable. So there will be a big demand on the policy side. The emission reductions, true emission reductions are definitely not going to go fast enough, certainly not for the 1.5, but, but even for two, it's going to be already a, a big job. So I think there will be a, a big push. And you see the discussions happening now in Brussels, for instance, on whether, and so this is a, getting a bit technical, but for instance, whether those negative emission realizations would be put inside the ETS, the, the emissions trading system inside the European Union, and then also what you do with them in the border mechanisms, um, or whether you create a separate market, uh, which means you can set the incentives separately for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the negative emissions. And then there's all kinds of additional conditionalities put, put on them uh, in light of how permanent these uh, emission reductions are, uh, but also how, mu how many side risks they, they would pose. And that's easier to regulate if you do it separately, but there's also, of course, market reasons to try and integrate it. So those discussions are happening right now at, at, at pretty senior levels and coming up for the, the, the next European Commission, for instance, for decision-making, but also in many European capitals at the moment. That also shows you that what is now this fledgling, well, it's not entirely fledgling, but it's still, I mean, it's not making a real dent in the big uh the big carbon emissions questions is is going to explode as a real market which also means that the scrutiny is going to go up uh, the, uh, the the accountability transparency questions are going to go, go up conditionalities on risk management are going to go up so you need to have a pretty serious enterprise and and be able to deal with that as a humanitarian organization for it to be worth your while and my initial intuition is it's not our core business and that you know the the competences that you need are are quite different. So you need a really good partnership with a trusted partner that will navigate those difficult waters with you. Uh, and and I would not experiment by building in-house capacity, for instance, to become a, a serious player in that field. That's a, a sort of honest first order assessment. I don't know if that answers your your question or if you have a more specific concept in mind at this point already otherwise we could talk further off drinks exactly so i hope martin you can join us for a drink uh, i think we have until seven so let's thanks martin for joining us today